Regarding some of the current events that seem to be rap rapidly unfolding, uh, with the strict authoritarian measures being implemented globally on the back of COVID pandemic, in particular the introduction of digital vaccine passports, many Christians have growing concerns about the loss of civil liberties and quite where this trajectory could lead. But the question is, are pastors of churches prepared to stand in the gap as we see this net closing in in society? Certainly one evangelical pastor in Israel who is certainly well aware of the agenda is Michael Nissim from Naharia, who joins us now on the phone. Welcome, Pastor Michael. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Thank you for joining us. You recently reached out with a global prayer event letter, which we'll talk about in a moment. But could you firstly describe for us what the situation is like for you in Israel at the moment? Yes, um, the situation is not good for anyone. Uh, it's not good for the vaccinated and it's not good for the unvaccinated. Um, okay, first of all, uh, I think we're all aware of the fact that the media have practically taken over and uh, they don't allow any dissenting views. And, uh, and when there are dissenting views, they do uh, ridicule them. So, so this, is, uh, this is going on everywhere and uh, in Israel also. And uh, people are practically brainwashed. Uh, they're brainwashed by, by junk science that says that if you haven't received the Pfizer jab or Moderna jab, or depending on where you live, in Israel it's all Pfizer, then, uh, then you are a disease spreader. Um, and, uh, and you are dangerous. And people are afraid all the time. We used to have the mask mandate uh, in, uh, that you had to walk with a mask outside all the time. And uh, most people did that, uh, unless they were brave. Um, now, there is no mask mandate outside in Israel. Only indoors you have to wear, or maybe in a very large gathering. They've, they've taken that down since, uh, since they, I think it, after the first rollout of vaccinations. And many in Israel are still walking around with full mask on. I mean, up to their, it's like it's up to their eyes uh, because they're just terrified. They think the air is contaminated with viruses. They're just afraid the whole time. I see youngsters riding their bikes with, with a mask right up to their eyes, you know, to protect themselves from any viruses that might be in the air. There's this atmosphere of fear. I remember once I walked into a shop just not long ago, and uh, I think I had my mask on just below my mouth. And uh, they said, uh, would you put your mask on? I said, yeah, and I put it on just over my mouth, but not over the nose. I don't like to cover my nose. And, uh, and then they said, would you please cover your nose too? I said, if you're vaccinated, why are you so afraid? They said, uh, wait, you mean you're unvaccinated? That means you're here without the mask and you're unvaccinated? There was like panic on their faces. It's like, it's like I walked in with, with a machine gun. <laughs> and this thing, of a, this thing of a machine gun, I mean, the prime minister, the prime minister, he said live on, on, uh, on some uh, interview, he said that, non-vaccinated or unvaccinated people who walk out to the street, it's like they're going out with a machine gun spreading, like shooting around Delta variants. Wow. And, uh, you know, now he's comparing us to terrorists. You know, what do you do with terrorists? You have to, you have to catch them, lock them up, uh, you know, to put them in jail. That's, that's the kind of, we're kind of walking terrorists. Others call us murderers, and so so you just feel like you you feel like a Jew in nineteen uh, in in Germany of the nineteen thirties. That's how you feel. 
and it doesn't make sense with the with what they they say is the science because we've seen that the vaccinated still spread the virus the same so none of it really makes sense does it yes it's like they're coming out with both the media come out with you know kind of reports saying well it seems like the vaccinated are spreading it the same like as the unvaccinated and yet another politician will say the unvaccinated are spreading it uh, everywhere you know <laughs> yeah so it doesn't make sense and um i was, I was going to on that theme of what you were saying is this troubling way that the unvaccinated are being portrayed across the world actually in, in several countries i've seen this narrative that is quite uh, concerning in terms of the name calling uh, of the unvaccinated people. I mean, how is that for you in in uh, Israel? What is the media actually saying about the unvaccinated? Yeah, well, as I said, the prime minister said that we're like walking around with machine guns, uh, spreading Delta variants. Uh, he also said that we are the reason that People can't go to work, they can't meet with family, uh, they can't just enjoy life. It's all down to the unvaccinated. It's all because of us. Uh, uh, of course, the government has nothing to do with it. Yeah, It's, it's just the unvaccinated who are causing this. Then, then uh, you've got uh, known media people saying things where Say 10 years ago, if they would say that about any group of people, there would be an uproar. I mean, I think they'd lose their job for saying such a thing. And today you can just say it freely about the unvaccinated. Things like uh, we should put them all on a ship and send them away. Uh, we should close them all up. Uh, <laughs> Uh, one of them repeatedly called us murderers. He wasn't the only one. There was a politician who called us murderers. But one specifically was really talking about us as murderers. He says each time we go out to the, to the street, we murder tens of people. And it's just, uh, it, it, when you're called a murderer uh, and, and you're murdering tens of people, it's like, you're building a hatred toward us. It's like uh, people have to protect themselves from murderers. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what society needs to do. Then I read this other article, and this was just not long after the prime minister's speech. Oh, another thing they say, human rights do not apply to these people. It's like, uh, th this is really, you know what I mean? You would say it about any other murderer, but you don't say it about the unvaccinated. Human rights don't really apply to us because we're just murdering tens of people. So we're all serial killers. Uh, but one specific article was by Professor Dan Shiftan or something like that. His name is Dan Shiftan from the University of Haifa. He was calling for marking all of the businesses that are owned by the unvaccinated so that people mm -hmm. know better where to shop. Now, this immediately sends you back to what the Nazis did in the, yeah. Nazi, in the 1930s, where they, they had uh, this guard. They had groups of people who were willing to stand outside Jewish shops and say, this is a Jewish shop, don't buy here. Mm -hmm. and, and then Jews couldn't make a living. And any German who would buy in those shops uh, was considered as good as the Jews they kind of turned the narrative around and said the Jews <clears throat> should know who they have declared war against. And they mean that the Jews declared war on the German people, but it's the other way around. Now, this is what they're doing to us. We just don't want to take your Pfizer jab. Sorry, we don't want to inject this substance in, into our bodies. But we are portrayed as people who have declared war on society. That's, it's kind of the same thing when people are saying, mark these businesses uh, and don't go to shop there. That's what they did to the Jews. Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. yeah. Another thing he said is, in that article, is uh, the, the, they should be taken away from any public area or something like that. It's like, 
basically confine them to their homes, let them get the necessaries that they need to get by, but don't let them go into any, uh, I don't know, say where there's a crowd of people or something like that because they're just dangerous people. Now, that's the kind of thought that you'd have about pedophiles maybe. Don't let them go to a church because they might target your children. They might, you know, that's, it, he, was, he, he actually said in the article, society needs to protect itself against murderers, pedophiles, etc., things like that. So he's comparing between us and the most dangerous people. Yeah, I think this is the article I saw translated. Um, uh, I think it said, no mercy on the unvaccinated was the headline. I think exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Which was very troubling. So such aggressive language, you know, and um, and I, I think you you also said that somewhere in, in the media you've you've been compared to parasites. Is that right? Yes. And this is by one of the leading doctors who are pushing for the vaccines. Uh, Galia Rahav, her name is, and she received grants from Pfizer. And she called you parasites. Yes, she called us parasites in the in the in the media. Like it was it it it, it was in the the title of the of the newspaper article. It was written uh, the, that the unvaccinated are parasites, which is of course very troubling because that is actually a direct reference to what. Jews were called in the Holocaust, isn't it? They, they didn't Hitler refer to Jews as parasites then? Uh, I believe so. And not only that, I'll tell you, I saw this um, this Nazi propaganda movie against uh, against the Jews, and what it had there was it, it was comparing Jews to rats, uh, and it showed uh, like this sewage or something like that and rats going out the sewage and running away and things like that and look, whenever you look at a rat you think like oh I don't want that anywhere near me I don't want it near my kids near my apartment uh, I mean I, I remember we were sitting in the living room and uh, there was a rat in the neighborhood and it managed to get to our balcony so while we were reading the Bible the family my daughter says look there's a rat on the balcony and there was like we were all like, yuck, you know, it's so you call the town hall. I, I, I asked my neighbor and he got rid of the rat. He put a trap for it and helped, helped us out. But the thing is, we are now the rats. The unvaccinated are the rats because rats spread disease. You don't mm -hmm. want disease. You want rats away from you. And now the unvaccinated are the, the rats. We are spreading the disease and people should keep away from us. We should keep away from people. Uh, I, I, here, here's an illustration. We went into a, into a shop, my wife and I, and this woman, I forget what she likes, my wife. You know, she always talked to her and things like that. And then she figured out we're unvaccinated and she had this fear on her face and she took two meters back and stood away from us like, oh, no. And this is how you feel, like, like you're a disease spreader, you know? Yeah, yeah, like a leper. I've heard yeah. Something. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it is interesting, the parallels you mentioned about pre-Nazi Germany, uh, pre-war Nazi Germany propaganda and things like that, because I've, I've seen uh, a video uh, the other day about how this, this company that is uh, been contracted to do the vaccine passport, certainly in the UK, but possibly elsewhere. You know, their history of the family that's involved with that goes straight back to to Nazi um, Germany, um, you know, using slave labour, uh, Nazism and, and that, that the family itself has very tenuous links to uh, to that. And so it kind of makes sense, this whole kind of digital system of labelling people and tracking them and, and creating a digital prison, you know, how that's kind of linked to the same ideology. And uh, I've also yeah. seen a Holocaust survivor who was, who was saying that she never thought she'd live long enough to be afraid of the same people with what's oh. happening today. So Yes, yes, I, I heard of this link and my wife thinks that this is, 
uh, a resurgence coming from uh, not a few of the same people who made the Holocaust uh, their their descendants. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Right. And, uh, Sorry. There was a, there was another parallel that I just just came to mind. Uh, I saw this picture of a lady's arm. Uh, you know that how they tattooed on the on the people in the in the concentration camps the number. Well, they this this lady in a university in Israel she has to go between different departments and things like that, and it was getting rather tedious to uh, to always show that she had the green pass and that she could go into this uh, section and that section and things like that. So they simply made a stamp that's written green pass on it and stamped it on her hand at exactly the same place where the Holocaust survivors have their things uh, stamped. And it's just, you can't help but think, wow, this is, it's going the same way. And, and yet not, not that long after it happened, you know, only within 70 odd years. It's, it's, it's crazy how quickly people forget, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is very surprising. I'll tell you what's surprising me in all of this. I always considered the Israelis and the Jews in general as a defiant people. And every trait has a good side and a bad side. I thought that the, something like the Holocaust would never, could have never been done in Israel because the Israelis don't like to be told what to do. And something like the Holocaust can only happen within a society that's known for its obedience and uh, obedience to, to authority. And then I thought that this could only happen with the Germans uh, and people like them who are very obedient to authority. But, uh, but it's not... It's not uh, so. I see. I see that you can uh, cause people to behave brutally to others uh, simply by instilling fear. And I thought that the Jews would say, "Hey, I'm not getting this vaccine. Uh, I'm not going to cooperate. I'm not going to be cruel to my fellow Jews." I thought that this would be the 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 general at the, the mood in Israel that I'm not going to cooperate with this. And yet, I, I just found that I'm wrong. Many people will cooperate and go the whole way. It's like when you tell them, you know, the thought of rounding up all the unvaccinated and sending them off to some, con to concentrating them in some place is not something that they shudder at. You know what I mean? It's like many of them would say, yeah, serves them right. They, it's like they don't think of what happened to them. <laughs> they just cooperate with everything that's going on. You know what I mean? It, it's very surprising. The same people that, that went through the Holocaust take it just a few generations later and they're behaving the same way to their own people, you know? <laughs> Do you think this is partly due to like a year of propaganda that people have been brainwashed with? Yes, definitely, because many of the things that are done now, if you were to, I mean, you could just bring this in one day. Uh, a friend of mine, he told me the Holocaust didn't happen just like that. It was a process. You had to get people, you, you, you have to take it stage by stage. And this is what is being done. People are doing things that they would have never dreamed that they would do, uh, say, a year and a half ago. Yeah. But they're brought to this state, and they're always angry at us for, for, for saying, oh, this is like the Holocaust, this is like pre-Holocaust. You know, they, they, they say, oh, stop making that comparison. But then the Holocaust didn't happen in one day. I, I must say, also the Holocaust, the Holocaust, was once considered fake news. It was once rumors. You know what I mean? It's, if you talked about they're rounding up all the Jews and they're exterminating them systematically, people would say, what are you talking about? 
There were yeah. there were pub, there were publishers, <clears throat> newspaper publishers in the United States, including Jewish news, newspaper publishers, who when they received the news, it for a few reasons they didn't publish it. One of the reasons was it just sounds so bad. It it sounds too bad to be true. It's like it can't be believed. You can't you can't believe such a thing. Yeah. Do you do you think uh, you mentioned concentration and and even incarceration? Do you think that people who draw those uh, parallels and, and warn of of maybe quarantine camps or uh, some kind of exclusion from society being that drastic? Do you do you think that there's credibility to that, or do you think that's just alarmist in itself? Well, we see we see these things starting to happen uh, everywhere. I mean, I think that Australia is the worst. We're crying about what's going on in Israel, but uh, but I I I think that Australia is having it the worst, is experiencing the worst, and and they're they they're making quarantine uh, areas like where they can take uh, people who have become sick that means tested positive or were next to someone who tested positive and isolate them somewhere uh, but this will become camps for for the unvaccinated they've done that in canada uh, australia in germany they've done they, uh, 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 there's talk about them doing it in israel they're building all sorts of uh things that look like prison cells and uh, and they're not being very open about what it's for um, so I don't think that it's far off I think see they, they have to prepare society stage by stage and they've already talked about putting all of the all of those the unvaccinated in a kind of a permanent lockdown if they don't uh, cooperate. Now, it's just said, it wasn't made a law or anything like that, but the fact that it's mentioned by key, uh, the, by the people leading this, the fact that it's mentioned is getting the idea into people's minds. And that's like the first stage. First, you don't let them go out. Uh, but then eventually you'll say, well, they can't just live among us. Look, there's still all of this disease going on. We have to, for the good of society, put them somewhere else, concentrate them somewhere else. Uh, I don't think that is far-fetched. I think that it can definitely happen. And that's where I think things are going. My wife says, with all of the parallels that we've seen up to now, uh, concentration and extermination are inevitable unless it stops. Eventually, they will want to exterminate those who do not uh, cooperate. Yeah, and it's it rings true, certainly for me. I looked at kind of some of the stages of genocide and how that comes about in society. And the first few steps we are on, yeah. you know, we have reached somewhere down that line. and. Uh, that is concerning. Of course, if it continues, that's where it will end up to, to from what I see. And that is uh, worrying in that sense. But um, yeah, we just hope it doesn't go that far. I suppose. Yeah, this is this is the reason that I sent out that letter about the global prayer request, because when these things are happening, you think of all of the natural ways that you can overcome this. Let as many people know uh, you know about this COVID hoax, and it, it kind of it, you're trying all the natural ways. How can we get people to not comply and this and that and ruin their plans? But you see, like it won't work. It won't work unless God intervenes. You know, God has to simply intervene and have mercy on us. Not that we're deserving of it. But we can we can beg for mercy and ask for God to intervene because the way I see things going, I don't think the governments will stop at anything. 
I don't think they will stop at anything whatsoever. I don't think they have any problem to take children from their parents, just like in the Holocaust. Um, it doesn't matter. I mean, someone said, some Israeli said, and, and this is really shocking, his mother died of cancer and his mom is a Holocaust survivor. A beloved family member, I think it was an uncle, in the funeral, or maybe it was in the memorial, while they were there, he told him, because he's unvaccinated, he said, we will not let this go until you are vaccinated. We will do everything, including concentrating you in some uh, place. And I forget what, he spoke in such strong language uh, that, that the, the man was shocked. He thought, like, he's, he's basically saying, we will do a holocaust against you because you are not cooperating. I think people will stop at nothing. Yeah, I've seen undertones of that as well uh, in different countries uh, to do with children. Of course, they're, um, they're now starting to push that children from six months old should be having this, which just doesn't, it doesn't, again, doesn't make sense with their science because they, the, it shows that, you know, that the, there's no risk, you know, high risk of COVID for children anyway. And um, it just makes me wonder why they are not happy with a mass of people having the vaccination. It, it's almost like they, they they won't stop until every single person does it. Um, yes. So it makes me wonder about the vaccine. I mean, I don't like to go too far into the conspiracy world, but there's definitely no long term studies of of how that might the vaccine could affect someone's health you know whether it's safe really safe or not and it just makes you wonder kind of why they're trying to make everyone get it there's obviously a lot of theories out there about different things but i mean what do you think why do you think they 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 want everyone to get this well there's a few reasons i think that uh I think one reason they want people to get the vaccines is um, <clears throat> the vaccines are harmful and uh, I really think that they want to damage people's health. They want to interfere with their genetic makeup. Uh, they want to kill many people. And um, this is part of it uh, to, to basically to knock people's health um, and uh, and kill people. Uh, but of course, uh, there's also the long-term thing. I, see, I don't know all the plans. We don't know all of their plans. We can only guess. Um, but uh, w once you get people willing to hand over their bodies regularly to receive some shot from the government, give up their liberties. I mean, this is like the sovereignty over your body. You decide what goes into your body. Um, if you can't decide on that and you just have to comply and go every six months and get the next shot uh, like a good boy, or else Green Pass is taken away from you. See, that, that gives you an obedient society. You know who will comply and who will not comply. And those who will comply, you can work with them. Those who will not comply, you have to take care of. They know too much. They're thinking individually, and that is not good for a tyranny. That's not good for a, for a dictatorship. Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is, this is part, this is, this is all part of it, of course. And, uh, and of course, uh, we're, we're all talking about these uh, vaccine passports becoming just your normal passport and the social grading system. Uh, a good person takes the vaccines, uh, keeps uh, social distance, obeys the government, but, uh, but a, a bad person, he doesn't do these things. So he shouldn't be allowed to leave his home except maybe to get some basic groceries uh, so this is this is all kind of tying into to the police state, uh, technological <laughs> police state that they want to uh, 
to 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 do in all the world. They want to to start a totalitarian regime all over the world. This is pretty clear. And obviously, there's the prophetic implications of that, and uh, the time, you know, the last days as well, and and even the undercurrent that looks a bit like the mark of the beast in certain yeah. ways that eventually this could lead towards something that would be the the final thing you know yes exactly and I'm, I'm happy you put it that way because many believers say oh that's it that's the mark of the beast now they've done that before uh, they've done it with credit cards uh, mm. they've done it with uh all sorts of things like say they they say ah oh, that's it that's the mark of the beast uh, I, I heard from a Russian believer that when in Russia they decided to give an ID number to every Russian citizen, many people said, that's it, that's the mark of the beast. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and that was maybe a hundred years ago or so. Um, yes, I don't think that this is the mark of the beast, but it definitely looks, it has similarities with the mark of the beast. And uh, someone raised an important point. He said, those who are already just bowing the knee, just complying now, saying, look, it's not the mark of the beast. Let's get this over with. I mean, believers, yeah? He said, they are more likely to then take the mark of the beast later. Mm. I hope I hope that this is not true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, certainly the, there's some parallels, but as you say, it's not, it doesn't fit yet. So, for people to say it is the mark is is error, but uh, and obviously could cause people a bit of a crisis if they've taken the vaccine and and yeah. uh, m- maybe regret it now, you know. Yes, I think that when you look at Daniel and uh, in Revelation, uh, there are certain things that have to be in place before you can even call this the mark of the beast. I do believe the mark of the beast is a mid. Uh, tribulation or mid 70th week event uh, it, and we're not there now I mean you can't stretch stretch scripture uh, to suit whatever you're going through right now and say oh this must be it uh, there are some things that are supposed to occur in the future that haven't occurred yet what we do think is that this could be leading up to the mark of the beast. Yeah. It suddenly looks similar. And one of the reasons we put out this prayer request is this. Um, we are, I am not sure whether this thing will develop into the uh, final antichrist rule of all the earth. Uh, as prophesied in scripture uh, or that this will be another episode in history that this will stop and later on maybe the Antichrist will come some things in what's going on now fit very well with what we read in scripture other things don't seem to fit they're, they're kind of force-fitted. And that's why I think, uh, I, I just think that there might be, this might be the kind of thing that if you begged the Lord for mercy, he might remove this cup from you. He might not let the plans of the global elites uh, be accomplished. Uh, we know that the day of the Lord is coming. We know that the tribulation is coming. And uh, and afterwards, hallelujah, the Lord uh, will, will come down and set up his kingdom. But, so, so we're not praying against prophesied events, things that are clearly prophesied in Scripture. There's no point in praying against these things. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the contrary, when the Lord unfolds his plans on the earth and you see things that are prophesied 
being fulfilled, you say hallelujah. The Lord has his way all the time. Yeah. But we're not completely sure that what is going on now is one of those prophesied events. And we're not sure that we have to go through everything the global elites want us to go through. We're begging the Lord for mercy that he would remove this cup and restore our liberties for a while. We know the Antichrist will come. We know there will be a a one world government under him. Uh, We know that most of, of the Earth's population will die because the Lord will do it. Uh, We read of all of these things in the book of Revelation. But we're not sure that this is the time. That's why we are asking for God's mercy. Yeah, so I guess it's that question of whether this is a birth pang that could succeed again. And then, you know, before the final time or whether this is the start of the run up of of the actual time, you know? Yes, we don't know. Yeah. So what kind of, you you mentioned the Global Prayer Day, we might as well uh, just talk about that um, for a bit. So what are the, what do you, what do you hope to come from this Global Prayer Day, which is on Sunday, the September, the? The 5th. The 5th. So you want, you kind of want people across the world, it's not like an online event, you want them to come together in their own fellowships and, and pray on that day together. Yes. Uh, They can pray alone in their room. They can pray with their family. They can pray with friends that they're used to praying with. And if they meet in the church, and the church is generally uh, uh, in agreement about this thing, the whole church can pray about it. Um, So it doesn't need to be an online event, you know, Zoom prayers and all these things. We don't need any of that. What we need is for as many born-again believers to turn to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Not that the plague will go away, because we believe that this is a a fake epidemic. It's a a fake um, pandemic. It's not a real pandemic. I do believe there is a sickness going around. but I don't believe that this is a pandemic for one minute. Uh, But what we are praying for is that the Lord would uh, ruin all the plans of the, the elites, the evil conspiracy that is going on right now at an international scale against humanity. And uh, so you listed some prayer points for yes, what I you can, would hope people would pray for. Yes, I, uh, of course people can uh, add to this whatever they think, but uh, I've got them listed here. First of all, uh, like Daniel did, first of all he repented for his own and his nation's sins. Now, I just put repent for personal sins because Daniel was very high up in the Jewish nation and I feel that he had the place the, to, to, to represent his whole nation and I don't know today as believers in the church if, if I can uh, uh, repent uh, on behalf of Israel for abortions and for the gay agenda and things like that when Israel is not repenting for it. Um, that's why I left it open if anyone wants to confess his nation's sins and repent for them, they can do that. But I wrote, repent for personal sins. This is the first thing. Make sure your heart is clean before God when you come to beg for mercy. Uh, We're praying that God would protect and deliver the believers because we simply have no place to run. It's not like we could say, oh, well, Israel is a dangerous place, but if we go to England for a few years, we'll be away from all of what's going on. It's not so. It's all over the world. 
countries all over the world are having a very hard time. Um, and some countries are worse than Israel. So we're praying that the Lord would provide a way of escape because it's, everything is encroaching. Everything is, is uh, closing up for us. We're seeing more and more rules against us, more and more restrictions, and more and more hatred toward the unvaccinated. So we're calling for a way of escape. That's the second point. The third point is the whistleblowers. There are people, non-believers included, who are sounding the alarm and who are fighting for the truth and against the lies. And they are risking themselves. They're risking their jobs, their money, their reputation, and their lives because Big Pharma gets rid of people. The global elites get rid of people who are in their way. So I'm very proud of some of these non-believing whistleblowers and activists who are sounding the alarm while there are pastors. It's just unbelievable. Pastors who are just fully cooperating with all of this agenda and what's going on and saying, yeah, the government is right. They should do that. So we're praying that God would protect all whistleblowers, believers and non-believers, and uh, specifically that he would reach those whistleblowers and those unbelievers, those, those of them who are unbelievers, uh, so that the, when they see the lie, that they'll see that it's coming from Satan and that they'll flee the other way to Jesus, that they won't just help us overcome uh, this tyranny, but mm-hmm. that they'll come to to the knowledge of the Son of God, Jesus. Um, We're praying that that all of these conspiracies will be known to all uh, and that that the Christians who are complicit or who have supported this agenda would repent. I know people who have prayed for me on their knees, Uh, people that I've learned so much from, from the scriptures, people who have edified me, people that I've looked up to, are now completely supporting this evil agenda. They are uh, obeying everything. They think that it's necessary. They're telling all their friends and family and congregants to take the the vaccines. uh, And whenever you try to point out uh, the dangers of the vaccines, whenever you try to point out where the things are going, you get such anger coming from them. Mm -hmm. And I I just, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard to cope with this. You know, it's, it's people that, that know the Bible, that love the Bible, and now they're doing this. Uh, we want these people to repent. We want these people to repent and realize that they have been wrong. And that maybe they did, maybe they cooperated because they thought that by doing so, um, they'll save their own lives or have an easier time. They have to repent from that. We're also praying for justice to be, to, to be done against all the people who are behind this this agenda you know it's not just that people are uh, making a lot of money through corruption they are actually killing people people are suffering and people are dying as a result of these vaccines people are suffering and dying as a result of the lockdowns and all the policies that they're making. Um, uh, I I know I know someone who 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 became who lost his mind as a result of of what's going on. And uh, the people who are behind this, they need to be brought to justice or else they'll just go undercover and surface again. Um, 
was praying that there would be a turning of the tide because things were not looking too good in uh, World War II uh, until a certain point. And from a certain point on, England started winning battles and things started to, to turn the other way. And this was uh, mainly after and due to a national day of prayer that was held in 1940. Yeah. That the king uh, called for. Yeah. Um, so, so this was the inspiration behind it. My wife told me uh, this story, and she is a strong believer that uh, when when a nation turns to God in prayer, and you know what, they might not all be born again. They might be just culturally Christians or something like that. But God heard the cry. He heard it and he, and he acted. He he did save. Or else what if Hitler would have managed? Yeah. Um, and then the last thing that I talked about was uh, restoration. Restoring the basic liberties that we enjoyed and took for granted. Uh, I remember whenever we assembled in the congregation, we always said, we thank you for the fact that we can assemble freely and without anyone disturbing us, that we can assemble to worship you, to remember your son, our Lord Jesus. You know, we would, we would always thank him for the for the privilege of meeting once more. But for many churches, this has been taken away and, and uh, not all the churches have, I would say most of the churches don't have the courage to assemble anyway. Um, we're praying that assembling together uh, without having to 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 tell the government how many people came and who came and checking who has a green pass and what the distance is between the people and how they behave, they shouldn't eat, they should wear their masks, things like that. We want that to stop. We want meetings to be perfectly legal again without any disturbance. And maybe God is making us appreciate the basic things that we enjoyed before. We would want a restoration of the basic liberties that we enjoyed. I mean, you want to see your family abroad? Just, you know, if you have the money, buy the plane tickets and go and see them. Now you can't. There's so many things hindering you and, oh, you have to quarantine after you've arrived and you have to do all of these checks and things like that. I don't want anything stuck up my nose <laughs> just because I'm going to see friends, you know what I mean? You can't go into your you can't go into your children's school because of it. In Israel they did curfews on cities. You couldn't leave the city unless you had a permit, unless you had this this is totalitarian regime. Mm -hmm. And um, they're making it more expensive to get the tests if you don't have the vaccine. Yes. They require the test and then they make you pay for it. And yeah. I think I think this includes the jabbed. Mm. I think this includes, at least in Israel, I think the jabbed mm. also have to do it, and the jabbed also have to quarantine. And I think that the, the, the people that took the vaccination are starting to understand, we try to comply and get it over with, and it's not enough. Yeah. And I think they're starting to realize that, and more and more, Vaccinated people are waking up and coming to the camp of the unvaccinated from their from their own will, but also the government is starting to regard them as unvaccinated because in Israel you haven't taken your third jab. You wow. are unvaccinated. Yeah. <laughs> Constantly moving the goalposts as we say over here. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you mentioned the churches, brother. Did you so the churches can meet there, or they or they can't in Israel? Okay, in Israel because there's a strong Jewish religious and Haredi community, they they did make an exception for groups up to fifty, 
that they won't have to have green pass. So synagogues up to 50 people don't have to have green pass. Still, many synagogues, and this really surprised me, many synagogues uh, do require green pass. Um, many synagogues are not treating the vaccinated, the unvaccinated, nicely. They they don't want them to come. They're a danger to everyone, and things like that. This really surprised me. Where we find the most resistance is in the most Haredi areas of Jerusalem and Bnei Brak, that's a religious a suburb of Tel Aviv, and uh, and Safed. That's where you have the most unvaccinated people in Jewish places. Um, So churches, any church that is larger than 50, and there are churches like that, there are churches of a few hundred people in Israel. Yeah. they're, They're in trouble. They have to break up into groups and things like that. And that takes so much organization and they're willing to do it. I only know a few uh, specifically one large church that assembled anyway. I'm proud of them. They got a fine and they continued assembling. Mm. Um, and I, I'm proud of these people. Then I know of, of, uh, of small churches who said, we are going to continue congregating. Is there um, a chance the pastor could end up in jail if he keeps breaking that? I think so. Uh, I think Canada has been the worst for that, <laughs> for for taking pastors to jail. Mm-hmm. But uh, but right now in Israel, there hasn't been a pastor that has been taken to jail. But I think we're kind of prepared for that. I told the congregation, I told the congregation that, you know, I already I, I already said if I go to jail, please let this brother replace me. Um, I want people to be to be ready. I think that we should be willing to to go to jail. I think that we should be willing to fight. I'm very very disappointed with the pastors here in Israel. Most of them have taken the the vaccine, uh, I mean, quote unquote, vaccine, um, support the agenda, support everything that's going on, fully cooperate. I talked to one who's a gifted teacher and has very good discernment. He said he fully supports what the government is doing um, because they, they have to protect society from the unvaccinated. And I was like, I can't believe I'm hearing this. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, hearing you and say that, Michael, is it's, it just shows the seriousness of the situation. You know, the fact that you're having to tell your congregation, look, I may go to jail. You know, that that's that's pretty serious. Yes, yes. Another another thing that disappointed me very much was that uh, quite a few churches have actually said, we're doing green pass. That means you can't come if you're not vaccinated or if you don't push a stick up your nose uh, in the last 24 hours or something like that. And I was just so disappointed. I sent a letter to one of them and I said, brother, always between believers, there's place to disagree. This is someone I know for decades. But I said, but what you're doing is a sin. And uh, he didn't like that very much. But I do believe that any pastor that does green pass in his church and say, you can't come here unless you get checked or you get uh, vaccinated. I do believe that this is sin. They've crossed a a border. They've crossed a line. If pastors are, are afraid to get caught and they say, okay, let's try and break up into groups. Let's try and and sit in distances and things like that. Okay, I don't blame them. But when they go as far as saying green pass in our church, then they are sinning. They are telling people the gospel will be preached here to the vaccinated only. Right. Uh, And some of them come from reformed background. And Mm -hmm. I say, 
how can you even call yourself Reformed when the Reformed have a history of of dissent, of saying, no, we will not bow down. You have the Christian nonconformists. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, you, you have, I mean, the whole protest against the Roman Church. It was, no, we will not bow down. We will not do these things. We will worship God the way we want to worship God, the way we understand the scriptures. And here they're saying, okay, the government can tell us who can come to the meeting and how many people we can have in the meeting. And they can tell us who's worthy because they've received a Pfizer jab or not. I'm thinking, this is bowing the knee. They have bowed the knee. And I'm so ashamed of these people. Yeah, because surely it crosses, I was thinking about it, surely it crosses that line. And uh, what, you know, to to uh, disqualify and, and cast out a, a brother in Christ from fellowship, the Bible gives certain areas in in regards to sin, right? Yeah. Uh, but it, of course, the vaccine uh, health reason is just no, no. There's no biblical precedent for that. Is exactly, exactly. It's like it's like they are regarded, like they are excommunicated. They they can't. They can't fellowship, you know what I mean? You want to hear the gospel? Hear it on Zoom. (laughs) I mean, that's ridiculous, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so, and and this is the last point I'd like to just touch on, if you you don't mind. Um, With with this whole thing, the the way I'm seeing it is that Romans 13, you know, there's, there's some churches that say, well, the authority, you know, we need to obey the authorities. And of course, there is a place for respect for authority. But where do you see this, the line on this issue in regards to Romans 13 and obedience to government? I mean, how, where do you draw the line on that? Where where do you think that is healthy uh, obedience to authority? Yes, well, look, those who are not wanting to comply with what's going on right now are not the type to to kind of rebel against all authority and things like that. We are all taxpaying citizens. Um, I hate to see it when someone uh, throws dirt on the floor. Sometimes I pick it myself and throw it in the bin. I like society to be orderly. When I go to the to the zebra crossing in Israel, in, in Israel, the law is that if it's red, you mustn't cross. I don't cross. Sometimes there's hardly any car around, and I don't cross because I want to obey the law. We all want to pay our taxes, do our duty, go to the army, you know, do whatever we can to be a good citizen and obey the authorities. Where, where do you disobey? When the authorities say that it's illegal, to to spank your child. So do you then not spank your child? They are going directly against what scripture says. So sometimes it's necessary to spank your child. So then you do have to do that sometimes. And that way the child learns that there are consequences for his disobedience and that he must respect you, and if he doesn't respect you, he won't respect God either. What when they tell you you mustn't pray? What when they tell you you mustn't gather together to worship? Well, gathering together to worship is not an option. And they can't tell us who we gather to worship with. What if they tell you don't read this passage of the Bible, read another? They did that. They do that. (laughs) In communist uh, China, they try to tell them what they can read. And uh, that's where you draw the line, because what they're, what they're doing is they are, they are telling you, you cannot assemble and worship. Now, w- everyone stopped assembling uh, for, for a while, you know, because you think, okay, you know, they're requiring this uh, lockdown and things like that. Let's stay home for a few weeks and 
fine, we all moved to YouTube and Zoom and whatever we could do to, to try and comply. But when you understand that they intend just whenever they like to just say, okay, no meetings anymore for, for I don't know how much time and only so many people can come and things like that. At a certain point, you say, we are going to assemble and we're going to assemble the way we understand the scriptures. When the Romans were persecuting the Christians, they didn't stop assembling. They just found another place to assemble, whether it be a cave or a graveyard or whatever. They just found places to assemble and worship the Lord. <clears throat> uh, there are things that you just say, no, I'm not going to do this. And I think that we should take inspiration from from people like William Tyndale. He didn't say, well, okay, Latin's a good enough language. <laughs> Let's just read the Bible in Latin. That, that should be good enough. No, he insisted on translating. And it cost his life and many others. Um, we think of many, many people throughout, many believers throughout the ages who, who said, no, we are not going to comply. Yeah. We are not going to bow down to your image. God will save us, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow down to your image. So you'd say it's more like a peaceful non-compliance. I mean, obviously we're not, not looking at a violent revolution or anything like that. We're just talking about peaceful non-compliance and civil disobedience, if, if that's what the best term. I haven't thought it through completely. I can tell you this. I don't think that it's the place of a Christian to take part in violence. Um, <clears throat> I don't think that it's the place of a Christian to take part in violence uh, or to support it. But I think that that what is going on now is so bad that I think that people will revolt and shed blood. Right. That, 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 that would be, I think, that's the only way I see that it will work. And I cannot take part in it, not as a Christian pastor and not simply as a Christian. I cannot take part in it. I cannot indirectly be involved and give hand in it. Mm -hmm. what, I, what I do think is that <clears throat> during these times, uh, you know, of there, there were partisan groups in World War II, and th there were partisan groups. These people were were involved, and this this also include Christians in doing illegal things, whether it be hiding people, hiding agents, um, hiding. Um, uh, 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 making uh, false documents, uh, lying, lying to the authorities to save lives. Um, there are many things that that people did and that Christians took part in that are not directly bloodshed, but that under extreme conditions, I believe God forgives that. I don't think that God will. I think that God supports a man who will lie to actually save lives. Um, that he did that he won't just say the truth at all costs all the time. Um, I don't think that there's anything wrong with a believer forging a document to save the lives of other people or say a person in authority stamping all sorts of documents to save lives. There are so many stories of these things that I think that when you look back in history, you mustn't frown at these people. You should, mm. be, you should be happy that there were people who were willing to do this so that others could have their lives saved. Yeah. And of course, we must keep in mind, we must keep in mind, as soon as such a thing is over, you have to cease from all such activities because 
the Lord wants us to be men of truth, people of truth. He wants us to speak the truth always. So, so we have to be very careful when saying such a thing. Yeah, it's like when we look back now at the Nazi regime and Hitler and, and those people, Christians that stood against it and um, kind of broke mandates that were tyrannical, uh, that were, you know, in order to save others' lives. And then we had uh, Bonhoeffer, who uh, yeah. who wanted to take uh, Hitler out, or, you know, join a, a group that was trying to stop Hitler in that way. But, I mean, as you say, it's very it's very different looking back from here than being in that situation. So, um, and I would I would agree with you that you know I would I'm not for violence at all. But what we can see happening in society could lead to social chaos if it keeps going that way. And and certainly uh, there are certain people groups that are very angry and and may take that into their own hands. So. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, and yeah. we do we do actually have Christians going to war in I mean yeah the Waldensians who at a certain point they had enough and uh, you know they were just massacred all the time at a certain point I think they actually picked up the sword um, so I mean we have to take that into account it's just that I think that it's not our place to to be involved in violence directly or indirectly it's very there is there is this uh, verse in in the psalms now i can't remember exactly where it is and i can quote it in hebrew and give you a free translation but it's lo yanuach shevet resha al that the that the scepter of the the wicked will not rest upon the righteous so that they do not Leman uh, lo dehem, or something, so that they do not uh, start dealing with uh, unrighteous things, and that's what happens when you have a totalitarian regime and you can't do the basic things. Now this affects you. You're not saying people who have been under this, under these regimes for decades. Sometimes it affected them in such a way that later on, when things are peaceful. They're used to white line, you know, and we don't want this. We want the Lord to spare us from a totalitarian regime that forces us to start white lying and start, you know, signing documents that we don't really stand behind or, you know what I mean, complying and things like that. And it erodes that character that God wants you to have, a character of truth. You know what I mean? Of of sincerity, of honesty, it erodes it, it it damages it, and we don't want that. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a very difficult subject, isn't it? Because I think of like even the underground church in Afghanistan and um, how they must, you know, in order to protect like the leaders of that, in order to protect the the people in the underground secret churches, it, it must be such a wrestling match between moral dilemmas and, and trying to do the right thing before God and but also covering them up you know, legitimately because you know to cover them up so they they are protected it, it must be such a, a difficult thing I think I heard uh, someone say about um, uh, the lady uh, who's the lady the Christian lady who hid the Jews um, Corrie ten, Boom. Corrie ten Boom yeah I heard about I think it's accurate her sister um, she didn't want to lie when the Nazis came after the, the hiding the, the Jews. And I think she told the truth and they thought that she was joking. So yeah. <laughs> she managed to not lie in that situation and um, still they were protected. <laughs> so Yes. And, and yet I don't think that that's the common. I mean, I like that story, but I don't think that that's the common situation. I think that when you're hiding Jews, you say, oh, there's no Jews here, I can't stand the Jews, it wouldn't hide anyone. You know what I mean? You have to, I think that to save lives, you have to be willing to, to lie. I do have a precedent from Scripture. Now, okay, Samuel was going to anoint King David. And Samuel was afraid and he asked God, well, what if they ask me what I'm going to do? 
And uh, I don't remember all the details right now, but God told him something like, well, say that you're going to do a sacrifice and do a sacrifice there. Now, doing the sacrifice wasn't the main purpose that he went there, right? That was half the truth. He was actually going to anoint King David. But God told him, tell him you're going to do a sacrifice. Why? Because he, his life was endangered. So you have to be prepared. I mean, God gave him the cover story. <laughs> yeah. And I think that as believers, it's, it's okay to have a cover story uh, to save lives. So long as we keep it for that for that purpose, so long as we don't let that erode our character, and then we get used to giving cover stories, and then once the danger is over, we're so used to just giving white lies and cover and cover stories that it's not it's it, it's already affected our character. That that we should be we should be uh, afraid of. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. That's a very um, yeah. It's a very interesting topic and. Uh... Thanks for bringing it up. It's, it's maybe something that, you know, as we increasingly maybe need to go more underground as a church in time, uh, these these are very prominent issues that we'll likely have to face. So I appreciate that. And yeah, just just to remind you as we wrap this up, um, 5th of September, Sunday, the 5th of September, if you can join together uh as churches at home on your own in fellowships wherever to pray to the lord for for these points that my pastor michael nisim here has has brought up and and to really um you know pray also for the protection of the church in this time because some of this foresight if it continued in that direction could really divide churches you know satan could really use this as a tool to to, to divide brother against brother, you know, that that could be a, a serious um, possibility. So if we can all join together and pray together next Sunday, um, yeah. I wanted to just uh, just mention this verse from 2 Chronicles 7.14. Um, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. So that's really in support of, of what you've been saying, Michael, about national prayer is so important, isn't it? So um, do you think you yeah. could just say a quick prayer to finish us off? Yes. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the conversation that we had, everything that we said, we said before you. Our Father, in these confusing in these bad times that we're living in we think of ways that we can uh, overcome and and uh, in ways that, that we don't have to to go through all of what we're going through but we find that we have nowhere to escape nowhere at all and you are our escape you are our place that we can run to. You are our refuge, our fortress. You are our stronghold. Oh, Father in heaven, please have mercy upon your people. We pray for everyone, but especially for, for your children, for those who have trusted the Lord Jesus for their salvation. We ask that you provide us with a way out. We ask that you hear our prayer now and especially on the 5th of September and turn the tide against the evil conspiracies that people are thinking up against us. Father, if it be your will, please remove this cup from us. Protect our lives, protect our families, protect our churches, Father. Please lead your people through this time and help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Michael. God bless you. And uh, you take too. care. Thank you. You too. God bless you. Yes. Bye-bye.